everyone to um, CSU Equine Field Service uh, webinar tonight. We have an excellent panel of experts here to discuss metabolic issues that uh, affect your horse right now. So um, again, I'd like to welcome everyone to our first um, installment um, of equine veterinary education um, using technology. We, we've had some great success using live meetings, but we wanted to explore this avenue and, and try to get you the most up-to-date equine education that we can without you having to leave the comfort of your laptop or tablet. Uh, but we would like for this to be um, interactive and we need your help. We need questions um, to, to make this as interactive as possible. So please um, use the toolbar below um, this video to, to pose your questions. You can also go on the, the CSU VTH's Facebook page to post those questions um, or using hashtag paging Dr. Ram. So tonight we're going to be discussing metabolic issues that affect your horse and this is a very important seasonal um, topic that we chose to, um, to educate you on tonight. Um, we have three experts. Um, I would like for them to introduce their, themselves. Um, we'll start off by Dr. Eric Renner. Would you like to introduce yourself? And then we'll go over to Dr. Russ Sakai. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Luke. I'm Eric Renner, and I'm one of the field service clinicians here at CSU. I've been here for a couple of years now and uh, really enjoy being in the area of northern Colorado. I uh, certainly enjoy working with horses, but in my free time, I enjoy getting out and doing some camping and fishing in the area as well as trail riding. Thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Dr. Russ Sakai. I'm from Visalia, California. I went up north after graduating high school there and uh, went to veterinary school at UC Davis. After graduating last June, I came out here to Fort Collins and Colorado State University and started my internship. Like Dr. Renner, I really enjoy spending time in the outdoors, fishing, skiing, so it's been a great fit. I really enjoyed my time here so far, and I'm looking forward to finishing out the year. And guys, my apologies. My name is Luke Bass, and I'm an equine um, field veterinarian here. I, I had the pleasure of going to this great university for six years, got two degrees. Um, one, as you know, is in Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, and then went to California for five years practiced at a large referral center there, and, and I'm very happy to be back in Fort Collins, back around the college. Um, decided to raise my family here. I have a three-and-a-half-year-old son and a daughter that's due in June. So very excited for what we have going here in Fort Collins, what we have going on in the field service, and, um, and really excited about the, the opportunity to, to present this information to you tonight. Um, with that, we're, we're going to have three discussions, short discussions. Um, the first will be on insulin resistance or insulin dysfunction. Dr. Eric Renner will talk um, about that and then I will um, give a short discussion on Cushing's disease and then we'll finish the discussion with a very um, important but frustrating disease that we face on a daily basis, laminitis. Um, after that we're going to answer um, any questions that you may have. We, we've had the, the luxury of having some questions already um, presented to us uh, today and yesterday via um, Facebook and email, so we'll try to get to those questions and we'll try to answer as many questions as we have time for. Um, however, I know horse people like to talk and they like to, to enjoy each other, so we'll, we, we may not get to all the questions, but we'll do our, our very best um, to get back to those via email and hopefully get your, your questions um, asked in a timely fashion. So with that, let's get started. Um, let's, let's turn it over to Dr. Renner and talk about some insulin resistance and then we'll kind of take it from there. Great, thanks Luke. Um, hold on a moment while I pull up this uh, PowerPoint slide. All right, there we go. Um, so as you know, I'm Dr. Eric Renner. I've already introduced myself, but what I'm going to be discussing here today is about equine metabolic syndrome, um, something that probably many of you have at least heard about, if not experienced with your own horses. Um, the contents of this presentation will be what is metabolic syndrome, who is affected along with uh, particular genetic predispositions that we see with this particular syndrome, as well as the diagnostics and treatments uh, that we use for it. So what is metabolic uh, syndrome? This is defined by evidence of the following, that being insulin resistance, uh, obesity, and regional adiposity. I'll describe what re regional adiposity uh, refers to here in a moment, as well as many of you I'm sure are aware of laminitis in particular is what uh, where we see a lot of the problems with this particular syndrome. 
Typically, these horses are considered easy keepers. That being said, that uh, these horses tend to maintain a higher body condition and tend to not need to eat as much feed. If you look at the body condition scoring chart on the upper right-hand corner here, you can see a horse that's illustrated, and there's individual circles that depict regions that we assessed a body condition score for. This is out of a scale of 1 to 9, with 5 being ideal. Uh, typically, what, what we define a horse as being obese is that that is of a body condition score of 7 or greater. Uh, the, the primary spots that we tend to see fat depos dep depositions taking place in will be along the crest of the neck and along the base of the tail head. That can be seen from letter A and D. Other regions that we assess would be behind the shoulder, along the, uh, the withers, the ribs, and along the top line of these horses. If you look at the gray horse down below, the orange arrows show these regions, and you can see a particular crest to that horse's neck, and some of the other pictures that I'll be showing later on will depict that even more. Other regions that we can tend to see regional adiposity or regional fat accumulations can be in geldings or stallions along the sheath, and in mares along the mammary gland region. So moving on, so who's affected? Typically, we're seeing this occurring in young to middle-aged horses, particularly seen that developing at the time of maturity, but it can also develop, as I've already mentioned, in horses that start to get older um, and further along in their years. Genetic predispositions that we see on these are that these horses have an enhanced ability uh, to mat metabolize feed and extract energy. That being said, that's where we come up with that term, typically these being easy keepers. Ponies oftentimes are predisposed to insulin resistance, and other breeds that we see this particular syndrome in can be in Morgan horses, Pasofinos, Arabians, saddlebreds, quarter horses, Tennessee walking horses, and warm bloods. If you look at the picture on the lower right-hand corner here, it shows a horse that just clearly fits that um, depiction of a horse with regional fat accumulation. This is a horse that's obese, meaning that he's a biocondition score of a 7 or greater. And what you can really tell from him is you can see a large crest over uh, his neck. You can see the large fat accumulations be uh, behind his shoulder, along his back, and particularly around the base of his tail. So the diagnostics that we generally use for this, the, the screening tool that we like to use is this resting insulin concentration. This is a tool that we use typically um, either on the farm or at the stable. Um, and what it involves is fasting the horse, meaning that we don't feed them the night before, although a flake of hay can be given to reduce the amount of stress that the horse may experience from not being fed. And then the following morning, we uh, draw our insulin um, measurements as well as glucose at the same time. And this allows us to determine if a horse is insulin resistant, has hyperinsulinemia or elevations in insulin levels. And by uh, measuring glucose at the same time, we can determine if this horse is able to compensate for um, the elevations in glucose in their blood. And thereby, um, if they can't, it potentially lets us know if there's any deficiency in the pancreas's ability to respond to um, elevations in glucose. Another one that we use is a dynamic test called a combined glucose insulin test. This is a test that allows us to pick up horses that based on their history or uh, clinical findings that we think have metabolic syndrome but that have potentially been missed from the resting and insulin concentration. This is a longer test that is generally speaking done within a clinic or a hospital setting and uh, again it re requires fasting these horses overnight um, but the difference is, is that we're actually giving these horses dextrose in the vein and insulin, so we're doing a dynamic protocol on this and then measuring the glucose and insulin over several uh, serial um, measurements of blood samples that we take to determine uh, is this horse insulin resistant, does it have hyperinsulinemia, um, does it potentially have elevations in glucose that aren't being uh, compensated for um, by elevations in insulin as the horse responds to, um, at least for what they're doing outside of these tests, would be a response to more energy-rich feed, feed that has uh, soluble carbohydrates, soluble starches that these horses just aren't able to handle because they're genetically um, adapted to be able to extract more energy from lower quality feed that they may have had to survive on in the, the wild. Other tests that you might start to see coming out that we occasionally do um, that have been under development is an oral sugar test. 
Um, and then, like what I mentioned, the focus on these tests is the detection of insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. The thing, thing to keep in mind with these tests is that these tests can be complicated by uh, pain and stress. So the time not to do these tests is when these horses are undergoing a period of laminitis. This will um, create false results uh, in our samples. The other thing is, like I mentioned, stress uh, can alter the, um, the findings. So let's say you're doing a combined glucose insulin test, you may be asked to keep the horse there a couple days so that they can become comfortable in uh, their new surroundings so as to not complicate our test results. So the treatment of horses with equine metabolic syndrome uh, is, revolves around two uh, principal strategies, one being weight loss and the other being improving the insulin sensitivity for these horses. It's often been discussed that there are seasonal effects of the pasture. Uh, probably heard that we recommend that you keep these horses off of the spring pastures because at that time the non-structural carbohydrate concentration and the starches within uh, the grass pasture is at its highest. And again, this is just too much energy. It's too much sugar for these horses to be able to um, to metabolize effectively and safely. Similarly, uh, in the fall, when we start getting into freeze cycles, there's just more sugar in the pasture. That's another time to av uh, avoid having these horses uh, out on this pasture and able to eat these uh, higher energy rich feeds. Other things to avoid would be uh, grasses that have been used for uh, feeding cows, as these are generally speaking um, higher in their energy concentration and those that have been fertilized. Again, just getting back to that whole thing that these horses have enhanced metabolism uh, to extract energy from uh, low quality feed. For that reason, we, you just cannot feed these horses sweet feeds. Even to bring these horses in from pasture, a handful of grain, you know, a carrot, an apple can potentially be too much for these horses. Uh, it elevates their insulin concentrations in their blood and by doing so, um, that link between hyperinsulinemia or high levels of insulin in the blood, insulin resistance, uh, there, there's a believed correlation between that and the development of laminitis, which is what we want to avoid. For obese horses, the ideal body condition score of a five or let's say it's a quarter horse would be a thousand pounds. Um, for those, we're going to feed them one and a half percent of uh, that body weight in hay per day. So going back to that horse, typical quarter horse, thinking a thousand pounds, should generally speak and receive 15 pounds of uh, dry forage or hay a day. The other thing that we recommend doing with these horses is just testing the hay, making sure that the non-structural carbohydrates, those being um, not, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the non-structural carbohydrate being less than 10%, that being said, that would be those soluble starches, those soluble carbohydrates that we're concerned about in these horses, that non-structural carbohydrate formula being less than 10%. Some people like to soak their hay for an hour. Um, let's say they have some feed that they want to try and use up where that non-structural carbohydrate percentage is higher than 10%. Soaking the uh, hay in cold water for an hour before feeding can reduce that um, soluble uh, starch and carbohydrate concentration. But if you can test your feed and get it less than 10% itself without soaking it, that's a more effective measure of being certain that you're feeding the appropriate hay to these horses. The other thing is simply exercising these horses. Obviously when they're sound and not going through a laminetic episode or potentially a foot abscess, but the, the great thing about exercise is that one, it takes care of both principal strategies. It uh, helps induce weight loss and it has been shown to improve insulin sensitivity for these horses. So with that said, here's a um, couple references that I used for this particular presentation. And I believe Dr. Bass is up next to follow this up with uh, equine Cushing's disease. And more about laminitis will be discussed with Dr. Sakai. Thanks, Dr. Renner, for that great information um, on equine metabolic disease. It's something that we unfortunately have to deal with um, on a daily basis. And so I really appreciate him taking the time to discuss that. There was one question uh, during his talk, and that has to deal with the availability of the PowerPoints. Um, if, if you would like a copy of these PowerPoint presentations, um, please feel free to email us. Um, the email address that you'll be using is cvmbs-socialmedia um, at colostate.edu. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll revisit that in, in just a moment, but again, it's uh, cvmbs-socialmedia at colostate.edu. 
www.edu.edu, and we'll be happy to share these um, PowerPoints with you if you'd like, uh, you know, like these again. Um, and again, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is if you'd like to share this with your friends or, or maybe want to watch it again and you missed a couple of points, um, please feel free to, you know, to visit the CVMBS, the CSU College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences YouTube page or visit the Veterinary Teaching Hospital's Facebook page and you can be able to watch, um, watch these again. So we'll transition to a bit of a, a different disease but one that um, is very important in our aging population that's equine Cushing's disease. And from the, from the picture on the presentation, you can see that uh, you can spot these from driving down the road. There, there's no need to get out of the truck and, and do an exam or, or uh, to get this diagnosis. These are quite easily distinguished. Um, you can tell that this horse has a super long hair coat. It's probably got some age on him, and there's, there's quite a bit of muscle loss um, in, this, in this patient. So what is Cushing's disease? Cushing's disease is a hormonal disease that is often affected by the often affect the pituitary gland in the base of the brain. And, it, and I have here, it's a tumor, but it can also just be an overactive pituitary gland. And that secretes a lot of ACTH. ACTH is one of those things we learn in school that is in charge of, of causing the adrenal gland to, to secrete a lot of steroids. What horses are affected? Ponies, for some reason, are, are, are greatly affected than horses. And it tends to be an older horse disease. Now we say an average age of 19, but I have seen horses in their early, early teens all the way up into their late 30s affected by this disease. It's a long, slow progression of disease. It's not like they just took a bad step and developed Cushing's disease. This is something that takes a long time to develop. The hard part for owners is to actually see a difference when they see their horses every day. So it makes it really, really difficult for you as a very observant horse owner to notice the subtle changes when you're spending a lot of time with your your equine uh, partner. We have some diagnostics, we have some tests that we can use to, to test for the disease, but nothing's perfect. Um, so we'll go over those in just a minute to tell you what we can do and what you can do to help manage this disease. And there's no cure. There's just some medications and things you can do to help really make these horses more comfortable and make them part of your family for a little bit longer. So what are you looking for? You're looking for long hair coat in places that usually doesn't have long hair coat the back of the legs. The hair is usually curlier, the neck or on the sides. The most common complaint that we hear is it takes them longer to shed out in the summer. So that is something that really triggers us to be thinking about Cushing's disease are those horses that have long hair coats take longer to shed out in the summertime. This is a picture of a quintessential horse that has Cushing's disease. You can tell this is probably taken during the winter time but the hair coat's a bit longer. Um, they're, they're, they're losing some muscle along the top line along the rump. Um, they're probably eating, I mean they're probably drinking and urinate, uh, urinating a whole lot more than, than normal, but this is what the classic Cushing's horse will look like. What else can you see from Cushing's? They may be lethargic. You may think, well, you know, he's 22, he doesn't have to act as, as bright and happy as he used to, but that could be a sign. He doesn't want to be ridden as much, that could be a sign. Maybe he's not as active in the pasture, not running around, not bucking when it's cooler in the morning. He's slower to come in at night. Just taking a little bit longer to get the things done that he should do quicker, that could be a sign of Cushing's disease. Another thing that we look for, may have a harder time rising and coming, coming out of pasture. All these things are, are, are things to look for when dealing with a, a horse that may have Cushing's disease. Probably one of the more debilitating parts of this disease are the chronic infections. We're looking at a horse that may have more than the average solar abscesses or foot abscesses. Those horses that have laminitis with really no explanation whatsoever, we want to be thinking about Cushing's disease. You have a horse boarded in a facility that seems to always have the runny nose, always have the fever, always off food for a couple of days, we may be worried about Cushing's disease. Other things to be looking for, tooth root abscesses, chronic sinus infections, these are signs that we want to be able to, to look at and say, is there something that's causing this problem? We want to look for the initial cause and not just put a band-aid over what you see. Probably the most important thing is the drinking and urinating. It can be so difficult because you're at work all day, you come home, you have automatic waters, you just see your horse drinking, but he may have been doing that all day. Very, very common um, symptom of Cushing disease is drinking and urinating. So what are you going to see? You're going to be filling the buckets more common. The stall may be wetter, the place he he picks to urinate may be more, 
may be wetter than it usually is. And this stall may smell worse than, than normal, may have more of that urea built up from, from more urinating. So how can we test this? I was joking or uh, I was joking earlier about not doing an exam on your horse. Of course, we want to check him out, but what can we do to diagnose this problem? There is a blood sample that we can take, and we're looking for plasma ACTH. Now, if you remember, we in the in the very beginning we said there was a hypertrophy or a tumor that caused ACTH to be secreted at a higher level. This is what we test, and we're looking for those levels below 35 picograms per mil. Why does that matter? That matters because that's kind of our cutoff level to say this horse is suspect of Cushing's or this horse is negative for Cushing's. The great benefit to you is it's a one-time sample. The hard part is there is a gray area in normal and abnormal. This also can be used to assess treatment. So for example, we come out, we draw blood on your horse, we put him on the medication, and then we may test him or her in 30 days just to see how good we're doing just to see how good and what progress you're making as well. It does, it is important to mention the other methods of testing and the first is called TRH and that's a thyroid resting hormone. It's not clinically usable right now but it's something we're trying to try to get um, to be able to use in the future. And then a DEX suppression test and this has to do with injecting a steroid in the horse and then testing levels at a certain period of time. The hard part about this test is a lot of these horses have had laminitis or may be prone to laminitis. So we sure um, don't want to set off any problems. So our most common way of testing for this disease is the plasma or the blood ACTH. So which brings me to my last point and that is what we can do about this problem or this disease. The one medication which most of you have heard about is pergolide. The really cool thing that we've had in the last couple of years is we finally was able to get an FDA approved medication called Persend. It's really the only thing that comes in the pink box, so you really can't mistake it for anything else. This actually goes and works at the level and decreases the amount of ACTH. In addition, we do advocate for routine farrier and dental appointments, so we're really not missing those abscesses. We're not getting behind on any um, dental infections or laminitis using prompt therapy for any infections, trying to stay on top of things is quite important. Routine vaccination and deworming schedule just improves the overall health of the horse. So that's something we always advocate to keep a horse happy and healthy. And then of course, just like we're gonna to mention tonight on several occasions, ensuring proper body condition, having an appropriate diet and exercise. Like Dr. Renner discussed earlier, diet is paramount in treating metabolic disease Diet is also in, in, important in managing Cushing's disease. So again, the medication that we advocate is Persend. Um, a lot of people are still using the compounded, medication, uh, compounded medications, either the suspension or the powder. This is the drug to use. It's the only FDA approved medication that we guarantee that will help your horse. Now from here, we'd like to transition over to Dr. Sakai and he's gonna talk a little bit about laminitis. Um, and then we'll have questions and answer sessions after that. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Sakai. Hey, thanks, Dr. Bass. Thanks, Dr. Renner. Those are both great talks. Um, my goal for this is going to be to try and tie those into laminitis, which is something that is a, is a major problem. It's often what um, is causes these, these horses in the end to have to be euthanized, and, and so it's something that, that we need to address. I wanted to start out first by kind of talking about what laminitis is. Um, as you see here, we have some x-rays on the top right. Uh, I've been told my pointer works here, so, so hopefully it does. On the top right here, you can see the, the horse's hoof. There's the, the long pasture and the short pasture, and then down at the bottom, the coffin bone. In the back there, you see the navicular bone. And when, a, when an, a veterinarian comes out and takes x-rays of the horse's foot, they're looking for what we call rotation. So in that bottom left, you can see that there's a bigger space down towards the toe of the coffin bone as opposed to up at the top. That's what we term rotation. So when we use the term rotation or sinking, we're, we're referring to displacement of that coffin bone within the hoof capsule. And, and that's kind of the end result of laminitis. Before that, you have inflammation of the soft tissues that kind of suspend that 
bony column within the foot. So that inflammation is is actually what's occurring, and then the, the result is a, a breakdown in the connections that, that hold that foot in place within the, the hoof capsule. Laminitis is a really fairly complex disease. Um, lots of people, lots of research have got, you know, has gone into diagnosing and figuring out exactly why this happens, but um, it's not only caused by endocrine disorders. Things like systemic infection, um, peritonitis, that sort of thing, any sort of systemic inflammatory issue can has the potential to cause laminitis. Um, for the for this talk, we're going to be focusing on endocrine disorders, but what we have is in these endocrine disordered horses, so whether it be equine metabolic syndrome or, or Cushing's disease, there's a, a type of inflammatory state systemically in these horses, so they're more prone to developing laminitis with just regular everyday issues that, that most normal horses would probably be able to deal with. Um, they become bigger bigger problems in these in these horses with endocrine disorders. You see here in the bottom right, there's a, a picture, and this, this illustrates the, the blood supply to the foot. And one of the big problems we have is that with insulin resistance, there's a higher concentration of insulin. And insulin works on those blood vessels and can, can affect the, the blood flow to all that soft tissue that we talked about earlier that becomes inflamed. When you reduce that blood flow, there's a difficulty for that tissue to produce energy and, and without being able to produce energy, the tissue starts to die and that's when you get inflammation and, and problems with laminitis. In the top left here, you have a cross section. It just illustrates the soft tissues that we've been talking about that become inflamed in laminitis. And then on the bottom left, there's a there's a really cool pro section here that shows the coffin bone and then the the lamina, which are the soft tissues, and then the hoof capsule here. So it's it's a way to kind of visualize what is happening. High sugar diets, obesity, insulin resistance, all problems you see with metabolic horses, and, and all cause this this kind of inflammatory state, which which makes these horses all horses and ponies all more prone to developing laminitis. So what does laminitis look like? Um, on that right-hand side, the, the gray horse here is kind of the classic laminitis stance. It's, it's every horse owner's nightmare to come, come home and find their horse standing like that. It's a kind of a telltale sign that we see that it, it makes us think laminitis right away. Um, in that, the left-hand side, we see a, a metabolic-type horse, a little bit overweight, crusty neck, out on lush green pasture like we're about to have here in Colorado in the springtime and, and we think laminitis. The bottom left there, colicky horses, down horses, horses that don't want to rise. Um, essentially laminitis is a disease that can look like anything. So what should you do if you think your horse has laminitis? Um, the first thing you should do is call a veterinarian. Always, always call a veterinarian. This is a very serious condition and it, and it requires veterinary examination and care. Um, the second thing you can do until your veterinarian gets there is, is, is ice the feet. You see there in the bottom right, they have special ice boots that you can use, but anything will work. Plastic bags, anything. Fill, fill them up with ice, set, uh, get your horse to stand in them, Get your horse to stand in a cold spring, cold cold creek, anything like that. Padding, so whether that be at the bottom of the foot or in the stall, um, lots of people advocate deep sand bedding just to take some of that pressure off, off the feet and make the horses more comfortable. And then pain medication. Your veterinarian will likely prescribe some sort of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, most likely bute. But if you have some laying around the house from a, an old injury and you talk to your veterinarian, you know, your veterinarian might, may say, give them some butte and I'll be out there in a bit. But the goal is just to try, try to make your horse more comfortable. Um, what I didn't mention on the previous page was some signs that, that your horse has, you know, maybe suffering from laminitis that you can detect. And um, one of the most prominent things we'll find will be heat in the hooves. And, and you put your hand on the, the front of the hoof wall and, and it'll be warm. And you can compare it to the hind legs or to the other foot, and and you know you may be able to detect some difference. And it's a subjective measurement, and 
you know, but it, it can give you a hint sometimes as to what's going on. So what to expect from your veterinary visit? Um, you call us out and we're going to come, we'd start with a physical exam and a thorough history. Um, is your horse, does it have a history of metabolic disease? What sort of medications is it on currently? Uh, what's it been eating? What's its regular diet? Any changes? So that sort of thing, just kind of the everyday, how, how these exams start. So, um, from there, you know, the, the veterinarian had probably put hoof testers just to see where the, the, the lameness is coming from. Most often these laminated courses are fairly sensitive and it's a, it's a good test for us to use to, to determine what hurts. The next thing um, we may or may not do depending on the situation is that if, if we do detect pain or heat coming from the feet is we may take x-rays. And these x-rays are important because they give us a baseline of, wh of what your horse's feet look like normally and then we can monitor changes. So if there is rotation then we can keep track of that or if there is sinking we can keep track of that and those are all things that are going to help with the long-term treatment of your horse. At-home care can be fairly intensive um, just like any anything every horse is different um, so the severity of the, the the event, the laminitic event, how your horse responds to being kept in a, in a stall, all those things are going to affect what the at-home care is like. But most often what we try and do is, is keep your horse as comfortable and, and confined as possible. Any excess movement is going to be uh, more stress on those already, already diseased lamina that, that don't necessarily do well holding up against that. So we'd recommend deep bedding, whether it be straw or shavings or sand, anything like that. Make it comfortable for them to lay down. We want them to take care of themselves and, and laying down and, and just being calm and quiet is, is the best thing for them. You know, over the next four to six weeks, we hope to get them comfortable outside of this, the soft bedding. And then at that point, we would probably recommend re-radiographing and, and starting to quote unquote regrow the hoof essentially around around the new foot. Uh, before I go to prevention, a little bit on that, the last one, the farrier, um, that's going to be an important part for us. So working with your farrier is, is a vital part of treating these horses with laminitis, especially if it's been severe enough that causes uh, rotation or sinking. Essentially we have to reshape the foot to the new position of the coffin bone and sometimes that can take up to six months or a year and so that's another reason why why x-rays can be very important. Okay so on to prevention um, as both Dr. Bass and Dr. Renner have touched on limiting access to lush spring pasture is going to be super important. Um, right now the grasses coming up are going to have a really high sugar content or non-structural carbohydrate, carbohydrate content so it'll be important for us to limit the exposure to that. On that left there, you can see a grazing muzzle. So if you really love having your horse out on pasture, or it's great for them to, to get the exercise, but you don't want the, the grass intake, then you can invest in something like that. It's a pretty simple method of controlling the amount of grass they can take in while they're out on pasture. Reduce or eliminate any other sources of dietary sugar. So no sweet feed, um, no treats. They make special low carbohydrate treats and uh, low carbohydrate carbohydrate diets. That so, if your horse does require a, a concentrate diet, you can get it in a low sugar form. Um, again, regular farriery and veterinary consultations. That relationship, our relationships with farriers, is super important, and we love to work with them. Um, and, and I think that the two parties working together goes really, really far for what we can do for your horse. Treatment of underlying diseases or, or problems that may have caused a flare-up. So we you know, need to know if your horse has metabolic syndrome or has Cushing's disease, and we need to treat that issue. Um, a couple other ways to control feed intake I have here on that bottom left there. Another picture of soaking feed and using a hay net just to slow down the, the consumption in that right hand side it's a type of um, creep feeder or control feeder where the horses have to just work a little bit harder to get to get to the grass hay. Um, otherwise just being being aware of, of what your horse is getting turned out onto um, keeping 
you know, keeping tabs on their feet, paying attention to are they a little bit sore today, you know, maybe what happened that would cause that. All those things are, are just um, important to, to keep an eye on. Um, you know, laminitis is one of those things that it's extremely complicated and, and there's a lot of research going into laminitis and metabolic disease at, the, at this time. So um, something to keep tabs on, keep asking your veterinarian about it. There's lots of research, like I said, and, and so there's going to be more information coming out. But right now, we want to just um, use what we have and, and take care of these horses so we can keep them going as long as possible. So that's it for me. Um, I think we have some Q&A here, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Bass. Thanks, Russ. And again, thanks, Eric, for giving some great information on some diseases that are impacting um, us as we... Um, go through the spring season. I do want to give a quick shout out to Dr. Stacy Bloom down in Boulder. Um, I know she's tuning in. I really appreciate her tuning in. We're working with Dr. Bloom at the Colorado Horse Rescue. Um, we were just there this week taking care of some horses, so I really appreciate her tuning in and, and supporting us as we go through this. Uh, the first question we have will be for Dr. Renner, and it has to do with the amount of feed. Um, this question comes from Jane, and her question is, what type of feed and how much should I be giving a horse with, with insulin resistance? It seems like she's doing a great job by keeping him off spring grass and doesn't letting him out on pasture until midsummer um, after the grasses have kind of died down. So again, the, the question is what type of feed and how much feed should I be giving my horse who's already been diagnosed with insulin resistance? Dr. Renner? Yeah, thanks Jane. Um, you know, the biggest thing is just uh, keeping these horses on a, a grass hay that, or I mean even an alfalfa, as long as that non-structural carbohydrate concentration is less than 10 or 10% or less is really what we're aiming for because it's those uh, rich sugars that are going to set these horses over into that um, insulin resistant state, uh, hyperinsulinemia where there's just too much insulin going through the body. Um, so that's generally speaking the way that I recommend doing that. Again, you know, it goes back to so you can try soaking the grass hay to draw out those uh, sugars. You want to make sure that you discard the water and uh, let the hay drain out before you give that because all of those sugars will be in the water at that time. Um, but ideally, if you can send that uh, a sample of that hay in, and your veterinarian can certainly help you with that to determine what is that non-structural carbohydrate concentration in that feed. Um, you know, when it comes to pellet feeds or uh, grains, you, you got to just not give them grain, barley, oats. There's just too much sugar in that for these horses to be able to, um, to cope with. So, you know, some of the pelleted feeds, if you need to feed um, some oils, let's say you have that case of a Cushing's horse that also had metabolic disease beforehand, or you have a metabolic horse that is actually thin, um, you know, you can feed pelleted feeds that are uh, low in concentrations of soluble starches and carbohydrates. Uh, some of those, you know, there you can find at the feed store or also talk to your veterinarian on which ones they particularly recommend or like. But, um, you know, if you need to try and put more energy into these horses or uh, weight in some instances, although less common, you can use oils such as uh, flaxseed oil is a good one. Um, corn oil and uh, there's other products that actually make specific oils that are balanced and soluble um, or in your omega-3 fatty acids and if you have any questions on that you can certainly uh, ask your veterinarian or you're welcome to email me as well. Dr. Renner, thanks for that. Um, our next question um, is for uh, Dr. Sakai and this has to do with daily treatment of a horse that's already been di diagnosed with laminitis. Um, this question comes from um, Jack, and, and he wants to know um, what's the daily treatment that you recommend for a horse that's been diagnosed with laminitis? Hey, Jack, thanks very much for the question. Um, I think it's a great one, and it depends on each horse. Um, but, you know, if we have a horse that's diagnosed with laminitis, you're probably looking at daily care, things like... Um, you know, these horses may be put in, in padded shoes, so take the shoes off, clean the feet, just kind of daily um, husbandry type things. And then um, monitoring how much time they're spending up, how much time they're spending down, how they're moving, everyday lameness, 
Um, you're probably going to be looking at everyday oral medications, some sort of bute or um, non steroidal anti inflammatory. Some veterinarians will use other, other drugs that affect blood flow to the feet, and so that may be another oral med that you may be giving. But, you know, once they, once they stabilize and we're no longer worried about um, displacement or rotation within the hoof capsule, they're fairly low maintenance. You know, you may be given daily oral meds, but otherwise you're keeping an eye on them, you're making sure things are going all right. Um, if, if you're concerned, call your, call on your veterinarian, but um, everyday care is pretty straightforward once, we've, once we get them stabilized. Great question. Okay, our next question has to do with Cushing's disease, so I, I guess it's my turn to answer one. Um, and the question comes from Stella, and she says, if I have a horse that's been diagnosed with Cushing's disease, how long does it take um, the horse, once it's been on the medication pergolide, for my horse's symptoms to improve? And that's a very common question that people will ask. And so the one thing I forgot to mention with the medication is it can cause horses to be slightly lethargic, and it can cause them to go off their food for, for a period of time. So if you do have a horse that's been diagnosed with Cushing's and you're, you're seeing one of these signs, please let your veterinarian know. But back to the question, how long does it take before you, you tend to see signs? You're, you're looking at weeks to months. It's not something that's going to, to, to be overnight. It's something that you have to be very persistent with. It's something that's going to cost a little bit of an investment to actually get your horse lined out. But if, if, if for example, we come out, draw blood, and put him or her on the pergolide and retest, and that that number is back in the normal range, we may be able to reduce the medication um, back down to a more manageable um, amount. And again, it's not something that we can take the horse off of the medication, but it will take weeks to months. Um, other than the, the couple of um, you know side effects that I talked about, the medication's super safe, and it's really the best way to treat your horse um, for Cushing's disease. So I think we have a time. We have some time for a couple more questions, and we'll. We'll go back to Dr. Renner. Uh, this question is from Jesse in Florida, and Jesse asks, is turnout on pasture bad for my horse with equine metabolic syndrome? I think it's a very, very common question that we get. Um, again, just to repeat, is pasture turnout bad for my horse that has equine metabolic syndrome? Dr. Renner? Yeah, Jesse, that's a great question. You know, there's a lot of geographic and environmental factors that play into that, um, you know, with the, the previous question about, uh, you know, how much I should feed or what should I be feeding my horse, uh, keeping those horses off of the spring uh, lush grass pasture and the fall uh, pasture when you start getting free cycles. The other pasture that you want to be wary of is um, those actually in periods of drought, actually kind of the roots and the stems of those. Um, start to store up more sugars. So those are the pastures that you want to avoid. It doesn't necessarily mean that the horse can't go outside on pasture. Um, it's just those times of years you have to um, be cognizant of those changes in the pasture and avoid uh, having them out on those pastures without a grazing muzzle as Dr. Sakai discussed. So a grazing muzzle is a great way to keep those horses outside. Um, the, the nice thing about that is it actually keeps the horses moving around so they're exercising throughout the day um, with those in place. And then certainly once you get into the uh, summer when that grass starts drying out and um, is losing its sugar concentration, uh, those are times that those horses are um, less affected at being out on pasture. But I think it's certainly if you have the ability to keep a grazing muzzle on those horses, uh, during the particular times of year that we uh, discussed as a period that we're in, concerned about. That's a great option to keep them outside and exercising. Great question. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Renner. And, and as you see us um, on the screen, our name comes up, and, and we're here to help, right? So if you ever have questions for us, you see our name. If you put a dot in between our first and last name, if you add at colostate.edu to the end of it, that's our email address. So if you have any questions that you're too shy to ask, or maybe um, you have to run outside and tend to your colicky horse, um, then feel free to email us, you know, and, and, and any one of us can hopefully answer those questions. So again, just put a dot in between our first and last name, add at colostate.edu to the end of it, and um, you got direct access to, you know, to one of us. The next question is for Dr. Sakai, and it's a very um, common um, uh, question that we, that we see. Can chronic abscessing in the foot cause laminitis? Um, again, the question is from Sharon in California. 
Can chronic abscessation in the foot cause laminitis? Dr. Sakai? Hey, Sharon. Thanks for the question. Um, it's a good one, and it's something that we all, if we have these metabolic disease horses or Cushing-type disease horses, it's probably something you're going to face. Um, like we talked about earlier, these horses are kind of in a pro-inflammatory type state. So any, any sort of infection or inflammation is going to cause these horses to, you know, potentially become laminitic. Um, whether it's a, a serious episode that, that results in, you know, necessitation of, of veterinary care or hospitalization, you know, it's hard to say, but any type of, of infection like that is, has the potential, especially when they become chronic and these horses are constantly dealing with abscesses, they're going to be bearing a lot of weight probably on the other foot. And that's another issue that can come up is, is as they do that, they're going to compromise the blood supply to those soft tissues and, and can potentially result in laminitis in that foot. So I guess in, in the end I would say is that if your horse is suffering from, from chronic abscesses, it's something that you really need to deal with as far as um, having veterinary inferior care come out, x-ray the foot, see if we can locate it and, and treat it accordingly because they can they can develop into well they can they can put stresses on the foot that will predispose these horses to laminitis. Thanks for the question. Awesome. So I think we'll take one more question a piece. Um, if you know again if you have any questions that you want answered, please type them in at the bottom of this um, viewer or you can email them to us, uh, cvmbs um, slash social media, I'm sorry, dash social, me social media at colostate.edu. Uh, uh, the next question is from Chase from Louisiana and Chase wants to know are there any certain breeds that are more prone to getting Cushing's or is there more breeds that, that Cushing's is more common in? And we touched on this at the very beginning of the Cushing's presentation but it's those breeds that are easier keepers. It's those ones that you just have to pass hay beside them and it seems like they're gaining weight. Ponies are more prone to Cushing's disease. Morgans, some, some saddlebreds, um, Pasofinos, uh, those breeds that are, that are ones that you really don't have to feed them much um, can be more prone to Cushing's disease. We haven't figured out if there's a sex um, predilection but we do know there are some breeds that really have to be managed quite tightly for equine metabolic syndrome and Cushing's disease. So again, great question, but um, you want to just watch those those uh, those breeds that are that are very easy to keep um, keep around. Uh, Dr. Renner, there's a question from Cheryl, and she wants to know: Are there any drugs we can use to treat horses with equine metabolic syndrome? Um, I, it seems to me that everyone wants a medication for every problem, so I think Cheryl's looking for that for that easy fix. Um, but is there anything that we can treat our horses with drug-wise or medication-wise? that may help with equine metabolic syndrome. Yeah, thanks Cheryl. That's a, actually that's a terrific question. Um, there is some drugs that we can use. Um, it's actually a similar drug that we use in dogs with hypothyroid disease. Um, levothyroxine is a drug that we can use to help induce weight loss on these horses. Uh, the, the thing with that drug though is before you use it, you got the foundation, the principle of treating these horses is getting them to lose weight uh, through exercise. Um, there, there's no real substitute to getting the horse, these horses to lose weight other than exercise and along with uh, dietary management of um, reducing the amount of feed that these horses are getting in a day, uh, removing all the sugar-rich feeds uh, that we may feed a different horse, like say a thoroughbred potentially, that's less prone for metabolic disease. Um, once you've taken those uh, steps of going down to um, you know, potentially 15 pounds of uh, grass hay or even down to uh, 10 pounds or 1% of the body mass. Um, if at that time that you've reduced the feed, you've cut out all the sugars and you've been exercising the horse and they're still not uh, reducing their weight to a, um, a significant uh, weight level that we would like to achieve for these horses or a desirable weight, at that time you can discuss with your veterinarian potentially using a drug such as uh, levothyroxine, metformalin is another one um, that is occasionally used. So great question. Um, I wish there was a miracle drug. Uh, there isn't. It really just comes down to exercise when the horse is sound. 
um, and then the dietary uh, management. But that is potentially a drug that, in certain instances, that can be utilized. Okay, thanks. Um, we'll take a couple more questions, and again, this is for Dr. Sakai, and it's a very um, it's a very important question that will come up, especially when we deal with farriers on a very constant basis with these horses with laminitis. And it's from Jennifer, and Jennifer wants to know, should my horse be barefoot or shod if he has a history of laminitis? Um, I think it's, it's, it's something that is, is gaining more popularity um, with the barefoot approach. But again, the question is, should my horse be barefoot or shod if he has a history of laminitis? Dr. Sakai? Hey, thanks for the question. Um, barefoot or shod, I think you'll, you'll get a lot of different opinions on, on how these horses should be managed, but I think it, it comes down to how we can best keep the horse comfortable and how we can keep them doing their job. So if your horse requires shoes to, to manage the laminitis and remain comfortable, then your horse should be shod. If your horse can go barefoot and you're happy with that, then, then I think that's perfectly fine. Um, like I said, a lot of it depends on what you want to do with your horse. So if you have a laminitic horse or a horse that's had laminitis in the past, but he's comfortable enough to trail ride and he's on rocky surfaces and needs the traction, then put him in shoes by all means because protecting those feet is going to be important. Um, you know, avoiding concussive forces with shoes is going to be vital for that horse. But if your horse um, hangs out in pasture and, and is a pasture mate for somebody else and is comfortable being barefoot, then then by all means keep them barefoot, have a good trip and put on them every six to eight weeks and, and I think you'll be fine. So um, horse, it's it's in, it's dependent on each horse and what they do and, and how you and your farrier and your veterinarian can best manage um, to keep that horse comfortable. Thanks so much Dr. Sakai. Well I think with this um, we'll call it a close for this evening. I just wanted to say thanks so much for joining us on our inaugural um, adventure into the Google Plus Hangout. Um, we've surely enjoyed this and we hope you have as well. Um, and, and if you need um, to, you know, to get a hold of us, again, our email is our first.lastname at colostate.edu. We have a fantastic front office with Sally and Becca um, that you can reach. Um, and also, you know, we, we, or we are not just three here at CSU. We have an amazing group of surgeons and a wonderful group of medicine people, as well as the world-renowned Orthopedic Research Center and Equine, in equine Reproduction Laboratory. So if you ever have any, um, you know, equine veterinary needs, questions, we're here to help. You just have to reach out, and we have uh, plenty of people to help you out there. So again, thanks so much, Dr. Sakai, Dr. Renner. Um, thanks so much for the college of veterinary medicine and biomedical sciences social media team. It's been a great experience and we hope you join us on the next installment. Um, have a good evening and we'll talk to you soon.